Aha, here we are. On the dark side of the cube, uh, here's the man himself, Cantor. Cantor is one of my big heroes, actually. I think uh, if I had to choose some theorems that I wish I'd proved, um, I think uh, the couple that Cantor proves would be up there in my top ten. And this is because, before Cantor, no one had really understood infinity. It was a tricky, slippery concept that didn't really seem to go anywhere. But Cantor showed that infinity could be perfectly understandable. Indeed, there wasn't just one infinity, but infinitely many infinities. First, Cantor took the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Then he thought about comparing them with a much smaller set, something like 10, 20, 30, 40. What he showed is that these two infinite sets of numbers actually have the same size because we compare them up. 1 with 10, 2 with 20, 3 with 30, and so on. So these are the same sizes of infinity. But what about the fractions? After all, there are infinitely many fractions between any of the two whole numbers. So surely the infinity of fractions is much bigger than the infinity of whole numbers. Well, what Cantor did was to find a way to pair up all of the whole numbers with an infinite load of fractions. And this is how he did it. He started by arranging all the fractions in an infinite grid. The first row contained the whole numbers, fractions with one on the bottom. In the second row came the halves, fractions with two on the bottom, and so on. Every fraction appears somewhere in this grid. Where's two thirds? Second column, third row. Now imagine a line snaking back and forward diagonally through the fractions. By pulling this line straight, we can match up every fraction with one of the whole numbers. This means the fractions are the same sort of infinity as the whole numbers. So perhaps all infinities have the same size. Well, here comes the really exciting bit, because Cantor now considers the set of all infinite decimal numbers. And here he proves that they give us a bigger infinity. Because however you try to list all the infinite decimals, Cantor produced a clever argument to show how to construct a new decimal number that was missing from your list. Suddenly, the idea of infinity opens up. There are different infinities, some bigger than others. It's a really exciting moment. For me, this is like the first humans understanding how to count things. But now we're counting in a different way. We're counting infinities. A door has opened and an entirely new mathematics lay before us. But it never helped Cantor much. I was in the cemetery in Halle, where he's buried, and where I'd arranged to meet Professor Joe Dorban. He was keen to make the connections between Cantor's maths and his life. He suffered from uh, manic depression. One of the first big breakdowns he has is in 1884. Right. Um, but then around the turn of the century, these recurrences of the mental illness become more and more frequent. A lot of people have tried to make out that his mental illness was somehow triggered by the incredible abstract mathematics that he was dealing with. Well, he was certainly struggling, so there may I mean, have been is, a connection. Yeah, I mean, I must say, you know, when I'm... Uh, when you start to contemplate the infinite, you know, I mean, I'm pretty happy with sort of the bottom end of the infinite. Mm -hmm. But as you kind of build it up more and more, I must say I start to feel unnerved by quite um, what's going on here and where is it going. For much of Cantor's life, the only place it was going was here, the university's sanatorium. There was no treatment then for manic depression or indeed for the paranoia that often accompanied Cantor's attacks. Yet, the clinic was a good place to be, comfortable, quiet and peaceful. And Cantor often found his time here gave him the mental strength to resume his exploration of the infinite.